Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. As always, it's wonderful to have Chase and Alex doing the switch here. Today, the person in the switch is Jacob Falkovich. Take it away, Chase. Excellent. All right. Well, this is not Jacob's first time on the podcast. Uh, Jacob has been here before. So we will, I'm going to skip the quote for today and we'll just jump into it. So with that being said, I'll introduce today's. That sounded like an explosion. Okay. Your microphone didn't pick it up. It was a very deep rumble. Okay. Well, we'll assume things are okay and start over. My apologies. That was disconcerting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could use that as the intro. All right. With that, we'll go ahead and introduce our guest on the switch this week, Jacob Falkovich. Jacob, welcome back to the switch. I'm glad to be back. Um, so, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, just hoping nothing explodes anymore. Uh, me too. The rest of the podcast. Uh, before we get into some of the topics that we want to hit today, can you give us a, I mean, we went through more of your story and sort of your background in the last podcast, but we do have a live audience this time. And in order to uh, contextualize some of the discussion, do you think you could recap sort of who you are, where you come from and, and what you sort of bring to the table conversation wise? Uh, look, my story hasn't changed a lot since last time. Um, I was born in Russia, grew up in Israel, came to the U.S. to go to business school. Uh, in business school, you're taught a lot that really charisma and confidence matters and telling a good story, like the actual numbers don't really matter. And I was there as a math nerd, feeling a bit out of place. And then this probably set me up soon after leaving business school to discover the rationality community, um, which is a community very much of people, mostly nerds, uh, both online and offline, who actually think that, no, no, the truth actually matters. There's a reality out there to be interacted with, um, with a lot of focus on things like mathematics and AI, but also on psychology of understanding how your own mind distorts your understanding of reality, especially when you're talking about people in groups. Um, so I started a blog, uh, I think five years ago now, very much in the rationalist tradition of less wrong and blogs like Stay Star Codex. Um, their own habits of things like putting epistemic statuses of how confident we are in some model we're about to present. Um, and yeah, I think maybe one of the big changes since last time is I've become a lot more active on Twitter. Um, I feel like it's very much a mode of expression and discussion that I'm enjoying, particularly in quarantine. I think probably last time we talked, I had 200 followers, and now I have 3,500. I'm actually trying to kick some of them away to maintain the quality. Um, and so I feel like I'm it's kind of like a lot more online, but also it's itself is a sort of distorted world of what happens on Twitter is maybe not quite what happens in real life. It's a bit scary when that takes over a lot of the information I consume. So I actually just put Twitter on my phone specifically because we, we have a Twitter for the podcast, but we really don't use it. And it's interesting to pick up information through Twitter. What, what has your Twitter experience been? I, I'm just curious. And the reason I'm asking, I would like to, I'm trying to decide what my relationship with Twitter should be. So what's your experience? Like, how do you use it? What do you get from it? So there's this common story that Twitter is, you know, like a hell site of outrage, which that's always been confusing to me because at least on the consumption side, you have a lot more power to curate what you see on Twitter than on other places like Facebook or Reddit, for example. So I've followed a lot of rationalists, a lot of people who post art, a lot of people who post just funny jokes, then a lot of friends of friends who are talking about spirituality and meditation and trauma. All kinda, so I've actually very carefully curated my Twitter. I think I follow around 500 people and I keep it at that number. It's gonna give me the right balance of things. And even though maybe a lot of Twitter is just trying to dunk on people or posting something to call outrage for whatever is the new story of the day. Um, it's actually not that hard to exclude that from your feed. Now, on the expression side, I find Twitter very interesting because it almost has its own language. So I think one of my pinned tweets recently was something that 
All of my tweets are sincere explorations of ideas and joking trolling and 100% signaling to my in-group and 100% pure nonsense possessed by spirits. So it has its own norms of discussion where, for example, it's less polite to ask someone like, well, you posted this thing. How sure are you of that? Which is very much a rationalist norm. Mm. Uh, and Twitter, it's more about being interesting than necessarily you know, having to stand behind everything you said or having to explain clearly what is a joke and what is not a joke, which stuff you retweet because they're thought provoking and which stuff you retweet because you agree with them. Um, and it's on interesting norms that I feel are worth diving into uh, because you can connect with people who you vibe with intellectually, you enjoy conversation with them, as opposed to something like Facebook where it's full of people who just, we happened to be at a party together two years ago. Hmm. Uh, maybe I'm not really interested in seeing what they put out online. Yeah, Facebook uh, <laughs> don't feel has aged all that well. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to consider my future Twitter use. I, I'm still not totally convinced, but it's at least piqued my interest enough to where I can rationalize putting it on my device and looking at it occasionally, but we'll see. So uh, that's, that's an interesting way to segue into one of the topics that I wanted to talk to you about. So one of the things that has obviously been on everyone's mind lately for the past four months has been COVID. We're, we're in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic um, and the response, I think, especially in the US has been interesting. It's been divided in a lot of ways. There has been information sort of moving back and forth, you know, even opinions on medical issues have become politicized. And I think the reason that I want to bring you into that conversation is specifically your focus on numbers as a means of quantifying things that you can use to make decisions. So, you know, we, we can, we can absolutely avoid talking at the object level about specific, you know, things that are politicized issues. I really want to talk about the psychological response people have to everything from published statistics and numbers to, you know, published guidelines and recommendations, how those kinds of things meet our biases wherever they are and how we as people who are interested in exploring ideas can sort of sift through whether it's the numbers or the stories, the data or the anecdotes, the media, the politics, any of that. So any part of that that you want to start on, uh, that's, that's where I want to bring you in. That's where I'm interested. So I think the, the important thing to start from is that the virus is a physical object. And so the virus doesn't care about us politicizing it, right? So the virus is a thing. It, like when you talk loudly or you breathe out, it's in droplets in the air. Uh, if it hits another person and enters the respiratory system, it can infect the cells and replicate. Um, some barriers like a mask can stop it. Some drugs might help, some drugs might not. So this is actually the one thing people forget about. The virus itself doesn't care about politics. And now when things happen, whether it's regular people, you know, in early February or March, who uh, haven't taken it seriously, um, I think so it might just be, I mean, I live in Brooklyn, not how far away from you, it does seem like lightning and thunder. That was right near me. <laughs> All right, continue. Yeah. I'll so, mute you. I wrote a blog post in late February um, about a, a, like coming out as someone who is worried, worried about COVID. So like, hey, I think there's like a significant chance that this blows up in the US. Um, even if the chance is not 100%, still worth taking precautions. Uh, I bought some masks, bought some beans, sold some stocks. Um, and also what struck me initially there wasn't so much politicization as sort of psychological impact. So I actually did a poll on Twitter a few days before to gauge the sentiment. And it seemed that most people like didn't even want to read the news about like the rate of growth in China 
about understanding what R naught is and how it spreads and what are the chances it gets to the US and spreads, et cetera. Everyone's just looking around to kind of see, okay, is it fashionable? Is it socially acceptable to start worrying about like COVID and doing stuff like buying toilet paper or not? Like most people seem a lot more interested in looking at what their friends are doing rather than looking at the numbers and trying to make the decision themselves. And again, like I mentioned, who was the way ahead of this was rationalist Twitter. So a few people that they follow because they are rationalists, people like William and Didier Eden, Sri Mauschewitz, Sarah Constantine, um, who are still writing things in research about it. They were like, well, we don't know, like, we look at the numbers and everybody else seemed to be looking around. And then you see that it's not just regular people. Um, so at the end of March, basically all of the health authorities so the CDC, Dr. Fauci, the Surgeon General, were all saying that masks don't work. And it was clear to a lot of people that masks really work, even in bandana works. And then you start thinking, okay, why are they saying that? Okay, they might have some incentives, maybe political incentives, maybe they want people not to rush and buy N95s, but why aren't they telling the people to wear bandanas? Okay, now you get into they probably have opinions about how smart people are and what, how people would behave if you tell them this and they think you think that. So you kind of get into this meta-psychological game that also, of course, like everything like that becomes politicized. And it's been a bit bewildering to look at that, seeing that from you know, the regular person on the street to the heads of health agencies every, or you know, the executive branch of the US government, everybody seems to be mostly treating this as a social question of like my behavior around the pandemic and the virus should reflect which side I'm on, who do I support, which authority I accept, which authority I don't, instead of an like observable variable, like a number of virus particles that enter your throat. Um, so it's been kind of strange to see in general, both observing this and observing the virus itself and trying to figure out, okay, does hydroxychloroquine work? How dangerous is going to a picnic? All kind of questions that actually in, require studying. In your view, like, why do you think... So, in some sense, there's been a false transparency to this where, as far as I see it, like, you can look at data sources for COVID case numbers. You can look at certain statistical facts about, uh, or I guess you can look at the statistics of things like transmissibility, death rate, uh, COVID numbers in various areas and things like that. And to me, the, uh, the availability of those statistics is in some sense a false availability of real information. The way that I see that is, you know, if you, if you are somebody who goes out and looks at COVID numbers without an understanding of what does confirmed cases actually mean, and more specifically, what does that imply about the spread of the disease? You know, you, you actually can't tell a lot out of a single snapshot, but I mean, you can tell some things, but you can't tell some of the relevant information you may be looking for out of a single snapshot of how many cases are in what area at a given time. You have to look over time. And some of that requires statistical analysis that the, the public at large is not generally interested in doing. Yeah. So feel free if you want to jump in. So... Like my first thought about why is everybody treating this as a purely social question of what's acceptable? Like, should I wear a mask is kind of the question of, okay, are skinny or like bell bottom jeans in fashion this season? And it's like, well, most people don't have any experience or ever need, like they've never, they're never rewarded for trying to like, you know, read medical studies themselves or trying to understand growth charts. Um, and Right, it's like maybe I'm lucky that, you no, know, like I studied math, I'm better at this. I've, I'm in this community where we like picking random topics and trying to figure out the numbers there. I'm doing this just because I, you know, if I don't have anything to write about, 
<laughs> I tried to dig into something, maybe like read the study, see if I can do the math. Uh, what I'm noticing lately is I think not only are people personally don't feel confident they can do that. And so it's very hard to start. You don't know if you're good at this, if it's even possible. I think they're actively discouraged from doing that. Um, because I noticed that I myself am discouraged. So I can look at some numbers and say, well, New York had 500 confirmed cases today. Over the last two weeks, the confirmed cases averaged around 300 a day. So let's say if you're infectious for two weeks, 300 cases times 14, that's around 5,000 people. Okay, now we're probably undercounting, right? We're not catching everybody. But the positive test rates are very low, right? So it seems like we definitely have like enough test coverage. So maybe at most we're undercounting by a factor of four. Okay, so that's 20,000 infectious people in a city of 8 million. Am I, all right, there's like a one in 400 chance when I meet someone that they're sick, let's say. I can do this math. Now, this math is not exact, right? Like it could be wrong. Maybe I think like one in 400 is the worst case and really it's one in 100. It's very surprising if it's one in 20. Uh, maybe I'm like over pessimistic. But people immediately become suspicious when you do that. Um, get accusations of like hubris and arrogance. Um, hmm. I get a sense that people feel like they can't trust me because I'm not just going along with the crowd. I'm like throwing up some numbers. Now, as far as they're concerned, but those numbers are convincing to me. This math that I did in my head, uh, there's no reason for you to be particularly convinced because you're hearing a lot of people spout all kinds of numbers. So as far as somebody just hearing this concerned, I'm just a guy who spouts numbers, who signals very clearly that I'm going to make my own decisions. For example, to go to a party in early July because I feel the infection rates are low enough and it's fine. Um, and so like, they're not happy about it. I'm right? kind of breaking the social contract of just following along with the crowd. And also signaling that maybe I'm superior because I'm doing this magic of like numbers that they can't even verify mm. if it makes sense or not. Uh, so it makes people uncomfortable. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting psychological phenomenon because it's not, as far as I can tell, it's not the numbers themselves. It's the fact that you are processing the numbers in a mathematical way that I, I think you're right. I think people in various ways have been discouraged from that sort of statistical analytical thinking. Uh, but it seems like the, ah, I lost my train of thought. Did you get social backlash from going to a party in July? So I didn't get social backlash from going to the party. I got social backlash for talking about the math I did. Hmm. to go to, I feel like people very much like on Twitter responded by accusing me of hubris. Yeah. And I think people actually have this model where if I just go to a party because like my friends call me to a party and I really want to go, that's fine. I probably won't catch COVID in July when the base rate is so low. But if I go on Twitter and I say, hey, here's why I think like we should go to more parties because the base rate is so low and your chance of infection outdoors is like less than 2%, blah, blah, blah. Now I'm tempting the guns. Mm. I've actually put numbers out there and like wrote them publicly. Mm. And now people are like, ah, this hubris, like you're gonna get COVID soon. <laughs> and like COVID again does not care about hubris directly. Right. Uh, hubris might cause me to get COVID if I'm overconfident in my math and do something stupid. But there isn't actually a god that will punish me. There isn't an authority uh, that will judge me for like this deserving to get COVID. And I think that, again, people transferred the style of thinking from social settings. It's like, okay, what do you deserve? Mm. Are you like rising above your station? Are you assuming something that doesn't belong to you? Rather than the physical world, which doesn't care about all that stuff. I, I have the feeling that when you, so I was listening to your uh, analysis just now of numbers and it, it sounded like the, those were numbers that you had run previously that specific example uh, if there is somebody whose eyes sort of glazed over when statistics became involved because uh, I, I think there are people who for whatever reason are psychologically disinclined to even want to understand the statistics of a situation in a way that's functional what, how would you recommend someone go about thinking about these things like and, and you can either I guess make the case for numbers or make the case for another way of 
processing this sort of relentless flow of COVID information? Again, somebody who doesn't really trust their own epistemology, I say, okay, as the first approximation, keep doing what you're doing, mm. which is basically looking around your friends and doing what they're doing. Um, and this is something that like, really works well when you're dealing with social issues, like culture wars and stuff. Just want to look around, see what your friends are doing. Um, but it's probably like a good first approximation to dealing with this physical issue or like a financial crisis or whatever. Now, what I would advise to them is say, well, you can start slowly building up your epistemology kind of bit by bit. You don't have to jump all the way into doing your own research. Um, so two ways to do that. One is you want to see out of all the voices you hear, which ones are actually correct. And you don't do it by seeing who's more convincing, but by trying to write down if they make any predictions and then scoring them. Then you might notice over time that some people are just more consistently correct. Um, and especially when they express some prediction or opinion confidently. And some people say they're 100% sure of something and that thing happens only 30% of the time. And so you can start noticing who you should listen to. And the second thing is you can start making your own predictions and bets. Yeah, it's like a staple of rationalist thinking um, about everything. Actually, I'm gonna find you recently. Um, there were news about Kim Jong-un that he didn't show up to some event. And I got a sense that this is some overblown little piece of news story and actually wrote publicly on my social media, hey, I think Kim Jong-un is alive. Um, I'm going to put the market in this. Who wants to bet against me? And a friend actually bet $60 and then he paid me when Kim Jong-un turned up. Um, the thing the rationalist thought is, okay, I have this opinion. I think my opinion is not in line with common wisdom. Uh, I'm going to express my confidence in it by taking some bet and then I can learn, right? Like every time I lose a bet, that's like a good learning opportunity to see, okay, maybe my model went wrong. Uh, so yeah, make, make small bets and keep track of your bets and keep track of other people's bets. And you can slowly be more in line with the numbers and reality just by doing those two things. You don't have to yeah. jump all the way in. You've mentioned the rationalist community a couple of times. Can you sort of explain what that is and where that, where that comes from? So it came from um, a blog called Less Wrong, which was started in 2007, 2008. Um, people who founded it were, see a couple of guys who met in the transhumanist, uh, I think email list a long time ago. Robin Hansen, who's an economist, and Eliezer Yudkowsky, who's an AI researcher. Uh, now, they started writing, especially Eliezer, and not about economics or AI, but about rationality as how to basically align your brain better with reality by you know, understanding all of the literature on cognitive biases in the work of Kahneman and Tversky, for example and understanding probability theory and decision-making as a way to like approximate um, kind of the mathematical ideal of how a reasoning agent that wasn't biased should be, for example, updating an evidence, et cetera. Um, so this started 12, 13 years ago. It accumulated a following online and has since then blossomed into a lot of corners. Um, so they attracted a lot of people who were behind the core ideas. Um, and again, those ideas are, for example, the idea of, okay, you want to bet in your beliefs, right? Your beliefs should be about making predictions in the world um, rather than something that is nice to say. Um, right? Like everything you say that you believe should mean that some states of the world are more likely and some are less um, rather than saying things because they sound nice. Um, so it's been out now, online communities, offline communities, a lot of organizations that promote this type of thinking or organizations that use this, for example, to research effective charities. So the effective altruism community is closely tied to it. Um, and also just you know, people who write in this style, just with this worldview, they kind of look at the world through this lens. Uh, so I'm part of the rationalist blogosphere. Um, I can recommend the book, by the way. Uh, there's been like finally a good book written about the community called The AI Doesn't Hate You 
by British author Tom Chivers. Um, so he came to this completely as an outsider. He's not someone who's familiar with the community. He just heard something about nerds in the Bay Area of the US talking about AI and just like, came in and talked to a bunch of people and did research and basically wrote a very good overview of what we're about and why we talk about AI so much. What makes the rationalist community a community and not essentially just a, I guess, just a mode of operating in the world? Like why, why call it the rationalist community? I think that once you adopt a certain worldview, it also comes with its own style of talking and speaking, a lot of concepts. Um, then you basically start spending more and more time with people who are into that or are on board with that. Hmm. Um, the same way you can say, well, like everybody could practice, I don't know, Christianity alone at home. But if I showed up to a Christian meetup as a secular Jew, uh, they'll be talking about a lot of concepts that I just don't understand and share a lot of assumptions in the view of the world where I wouldn't even understand they're saying something. What do they mean? Do they mean it explicitly? What values do they share? So there are now a lot of people who, uh, the heart of the community is in the Bay Area, uh, mostly around Berkeley. A lot of people live in there in group houses and actually organizing big meetups. Uh, we've had an in-person meetup in New York running for basically 12 years with no interruption from 2008 until March 14th, 2020. Hmm. I think this is the longest hiatus from in-person meetups we've had. Um, Does that... I feel like that has an insulating effect and that, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but is that something that's talked about in the rationalist community is the insulating effect of having sort of your own, um, like you said, style of speaking and, and. Yeah, 100%. So even in the initial kind of series of blog posts, we basically assembled the community by Eliezer. He has an entire sequence of posts just about, Hey, uh, groups of people who get excited about the idea sometimes become cults. Let's understand what cults are and make sure we don't become one. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm sure we have our own kind of biases or things that color our bubble that don't necessarily even have to do with rationality itself as a worldview, but just the sort of people it attracts. Um, so I don't know if the community has like more people who are into computer science and less plumbers and also like more PhDs and uh, less people who speak Swahili and like that by itself is going to color us one way or another. Yeah, um, that's fair. Uh, and I, I didn't mean, yeah, uh, well, like I said, I, I didn't mean that to be a negative per se, cause, because I think that in communities, there are absolutely rational reasons for creating filters that, insulate you from certain types of people but and I, and I think that having the filters be centered around the ethos of the community is I mean it, it's at the very least in my opinion something to do deliberately so it's not a very strong community in that sense uh, no. like in this sense like much weaker than the church would be like a lot of people who have spent let's say a solid 50 hours of their lives reading blogs like say star codex or the sequences they don't call themselves rationalists because maybe they don't like the brand. They don't want people to think they're like nerds in the autistic spectrum, or they think Eliezer is arrogant, or they, you know, they think we have like too many libertarians or too many this or too many that. So a lot of people who share the worldview or the lingo and the style of thinking and participate in it, but like never call themselves rationalists. I think the number of those there are probably tens of thousands of those versus a few hundred people who actually live in rationalist group houses yeah. and work for the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, et cetera, who are really fully in the community. You mentioned Slate Star Codex, and you sent me an interesting New Yorker article um, in the context of media scrutiny of the rationalist community. Can you sort of talk about what you meant by that and what happened with the Slate Star Codex? Yeah, so here I'm gonna try to talk a bit about it at a bit of a remove. This, mm -hmm. as people say, like a live ongoing story. Um, so also Chase, your picture froze and I don't know if you can hear me or if I can hear you. I can hear uh, I'm you. I'm gonna keep talking until 
it so also looks like chat. your picture was open. happening. Uh oh, did we lose Jacob? Times reached out to me and also to oh, a lot of yeah, you're back. Go ahead. Um, so the New York Times reached out to me and also to a lot of other I guess rationalist bloggers. Uh, mostly talk about what we're about, what's our connection to Silicon Valley, and why we were saying all the correct things about COVID back in late February, early March, when everybody else was wrong. Um, and this seemed like, okay, I was going to write a piece. Some people were worried about this. Um, but they thought, oh, the, the New York Times, that's not quite our in-group. They're not truth-oriented nerds like us. They're journalists with their own spins. Uh, I thought this was fine, you know. We did something good. We told a lot of people about COVID early. We deserve some visibility. Maybe some people will join. Um, then the most prominent blog in the community is the blog called Slacer Codex, written by an man named Scott Alexander. That is not his full real name. Um, now, he is very widely read, including by a lot of journalists and intellectuals, kind of like a shocking amount of people that I've just never heard about. They would drop that they read something from him. Um, so when they reached out to him, um, he said he would only grant them an interview on condition that they don't publish his full name, uh, which they managed to figure out. And they said that they have a policy to publish his real name no matter what. So he refused to, uh, refused to give an interview. Then that in itself became a new story when he basically took down his blog and then other media outlets were writing about the New York Times threatens to dox a blogger. And now it's unclear because they haven't published anything. Uh, the New Yorker published a story by Gideon Lewis Krauss about both who the community is and what happened with the New York Times story. And the somewhat separate thing of a group of Silicon Valley venture capitalists basically having declared war and journalism and like refusing to talk to the New York Times anymore, mm. citing this, you know, divergent values, etc. So um, we have gotten some visibility. There's a story in the New Yorker now, again, in a book that came out last year, and also some things that are indirectly related to, you know, me or Scott just writing our blog and other people, um, kind of about media in general that, I don't know much about him as a journalist. I was happy to talk to Kate Metz when he called me. Same time. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. I mean, it, it seems like rationalists, as far as I can tell, tend to present themselves well. And even mainstream media scrutiny, uh, worst case, a hit piece, wouldn't cut that deep because on anything beyond surface investigation, you sort of, you sort of see up front what rationalists are all about and what the rationalist community is all about. I, I don't know. That... So some people see it up front, right? So as you can guess, like a huge value for in the rationality community is that everything should be up to debate and the debate should be somewhat like according to scientific norms. Okay, I've taken things out of like the immediate lived context and experience of people and treating them as like, open scientific questions as if we're aliens debating this and that. Um, that means that unrationalist forums, including, for example, in the comments of Stacey Codex or on Reddit or on Less Wrong, uh, you will see discussions of politically touchy topics, everything from like recent protests to, I don't know, psychological differences between the genders or whatever, um, in a way that kind of taken out of the context of the rationality community in like any situation, if you like saw this discussion in place of there are other norms around what's acceptable and what's not acceptable to say is a clear signal of like political affiliation one way or another. Also there are people with political affiliations one way or another in the kind of like welcome to in the rationality community uh, from all sides, all sorts of crazy people that the community kind of cares a lot about, right? We're going to judge people based on ideas and not trying to um, so too many purity tests. Um, so I actually discovered Less Wrong from a hit piece, basically, on Slate.com, talking about, hey, there's a website of weird nerds talking about some like AI from the future that's going to kill them. 
really, really just mocking them. And almost in like the style of, I don't know, like a high school football team mocking the chess team or something. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I was curious, I clicked through. And so that's how I discovered Let's Wrong. Uh, and thought, oh, okay, this is actually great. But I assume that those people know what they're writing and most of the people they're writing for we're happy to just agree this and chuckle with the nerds mm-hmm. and move on. Um, again, I think this might be a good trade-off. Like if someone writes uh, even a hit piece, and all right, they talk about all those like ideas because they're like privileged to think they can be here and just talk about the stuff. And some people will you know, be very upset online. Uh, and a few people uh, who are themselves probably inclined to this style psychologically, will come in and join and become our friends. Um, I understand how like within the Russian community, especially among the prominent people, you know, like Scott who has his own website and forum, there'll be a lot of disagreement about, is this actually good? Is this actually bad? You said that different people will have different trade-offs. It's like a self-oscillating intellectual filter as far as I see it. I, I mean, the idea, yeah, there are many thoughts that came up from that. First of all, the idea that uh, that a criticism could be you're letting too many people in from X political affiliation or attracting too many people from X or Y political affiliation in a community that clearly I think has, like you said, people from all sides. That's, that's an interesting criticism. Um, but like what I mean by self-oscillating filter in music, I don't know if you're familiar with the way that filters work in uh, music production, but uh, essentially you can drive a, a filter to the point where rather than simply filtering out parts of a signal, it can actually self-oscillate and begin to generate a periodic signal on its own. So the only way that I, I mean, the way that I see that applying in this case is just that, I mean, I, I said, even in a hit piece, you're going to find people who see right through that and see into what the rationalist community is trying to do, do because it puts itself on its surface. And like you are even an example of that, that that's how you found out. Yeah. So, I guess. right. So somebody, Again, another rationalist concept is steel manning. Yeah. The steel is the opposite of straw manning. Right? So the steel man of kind of our outgroup, the opposition, would say, look, you know, if you have a lot of people and they're still discussing and citing some studies, and if you don't know where those studies are, they're good or they're bad, uh, a bunch of guys talking about like psychological differences in gender, let's say. Uh, which is actually like something the New Yorker quoted as like an unsavory idea we're talking about. They'll say, well, this like, you know, might make it not welcoming to women. Maybe like especially make it not welcoming to women who are themselves in spaces where there are a lot of men, like, you know, women who are working as programmers. Um, Now, I don't think, like, I think it's fine that we would have, you know, one place for people to have this sort of discussion and they can throw studies at each other and try to figure this out. And then like another space, where everybody agreed, hey, we're, um, we have some like, tension here between men and women and all kind of other things. We're like not gonna have this discussion. Uh, if you're like bringing this up, it doesn't matter if you think this is like true and objective, uh, we're not gonna have it here. Um, so I think it's fine for both of those spaces to exist. Um, and again, like we said before, it's so rationalists love, you know, digging into the numbers, but other people are uncomfortable digging into the numbers. They haven't success with it, they haven't learned how to do it well, they feel very suspicious of everybody who's telling them about all kinds of numbers is trying to sell them on some cryptocurrency that's a Ponzi scheme. Um, so like they would not be comfortable in this space and would be suspicious of it. So I'm not trying to claim some unusual virtue for rationalists, like our way is correct because we're truth oriented and everybody else isn't. Um, again, like I said, I was probably initially inclined from everything in my life to uh, find this community a warm home. Um, and so it's fine if other people see this and they don't like it, they don't want to join, they find it uncomfortable. Uh, but there is a thread that 
if you then take things from this community and put them front page of the New York Times, now basically our safe space is now judged by the standards of national media, which has its own different standards for discourse and debate, etc. One of the ideas that I wanted to run by you in this context as well, I, I a couple of weeks ago was thinking about this analogy of a trench. And are you familiar with sort of historical, the historical context of trench warfare, like World War I pre versus post? Uh, maybe just to recap for anybody who uh, is not totally familiar, sort of pre-World War I, and I'm not an expert on this part of history, this is just a broad understanding, pre-World War I-ish, warfare in the sort of Western world was almost gentlemanly, where there were these sets of rules, you were sort of expected to show up with your army in your colors, in formation, at the battlefield, and you sort of everybody, you know, stand up and fight. And when the first row gets shot down, the next people step up. I, still barbaric and brutal, but there's a, there was a sort of, um, like I said, a, a set of rules around it that was expected. And then World War One comes along and for whatever reason, and it, I think it's a technological reason people start abandoning some of those rules and end up fighting in a totally different style. And I, I won't get into a lot of it, but what you find is that a lot of people dig into trenches. This is where trench warfare comes from. You have entire armies that have built these miles long trenches in the ground where you can stuff troops and they can pop up and shoot at the other troops in the other trench across the way. And the problem with that tactically is you can't move a trench. So you, you can't, I mean, you can dig a new trench, but that requires a whole lot of movement, a whole lot of exposure. You can take over someone else's trench, but in terms of tactics and movement, when you are entrenched, you're not moving. And the word entrenched has become a descriptor for someone whose intellectual position is fortified in that sense, that they're, they're not in a place where they're willing to move. And I was thinking about this analogy in politics recently, and I think there's another piece of it that I think is worth talking about. People have talked about people being politically entrenched for a long time. That's not a new idea. But what I think is happening a lot is there are people more and more as people are driven into trenches, it becomes more and more obvious when people who are not moving into those trenches uh, aren't doing so. They're essentially standing in no man's land. And again, for context in the analogy, in World War I, no man's land was the area between the trenches where there were no people because if you stood out there, you could get shot at from both sides and you would die. So essentially any removal from your trench, you were fair game to get shot at and you could get friendly fire incidents. You could get incidents of random violence from things like artillery shells falling. And to not stand in a trench was essentially to expose yourself in a way that was guaranteed to cause some amount of harm. I think I see that happening politically in a lot of ways, maybe even more dimensionally than just a simple trench analogy. Do you see that happening? And do you see the rationalist community or I guess people in general? I don't know. Uh, how, first, how do you yeah. respond to that as an analogy? I mean, analogy makes a lot of sense. And so there's like two ways not to be in a trench. You can be in no man's land or you can just be far away. So let's say we've seen some like new trenches dug in places recently. Um, like the question of police budgets, there was like some minor skirmishing there. And now there's like two massive armies that came in and dug and abolished the police trench and dug, a, no, no, we need to strengthen the police to crack down on crime trench. And they're just there. Um, and again, if you come in with an opinion on police budgets, that's not one of those you're kind of in no man's land. Hmm. 
And if you come with the opinion of, hey, you know what? I've like spent basically zero hours of my life thinking about police budgets. Um, I don't really know where that money goes. I like, don't know everything the police do. I don't know like what sort of people they hire. There's a coconut statistics floating around. I'm just gonna like, stay far away from like that entire battlefield zone. Um, so that's like a little safer, but then of course the people in the trenches, um, they get upset at you for being a draft dodger and not jumping into <laughs> one or another. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the rationalist instinct probably, or at least mine, is to stay away from the things that become entrenched. Uh, also, it seems like it's very hard to make an impact there, even if you care about making an impact on policy. Um, Robin Hansen, the GMU economist, his analogy is pulling the rope sideways. So if you see two sides pulling a rope and you apply some force to one of the sides, you really don't move the rope very much. Uh, because there's already so much, you know, directly canceling force applied. If you pull in it sideways, you can actually move it quite a bit in your direction. I don't know. Maybe now is the time, as everybody's hashing out police budgets, to talk about sanitation budgets <laughs> or, I don't know, education or things like that. Um, I think our host has disappeared. <laughs> oh, he's having some internet problems. He, he will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. It's just someone threatening with the, when the podcast host hears explosions in the background and then he says that he sees lightning and then he mysteriously vanishes from everyone's screens. Oh, no, no. I'll, uh, I'll pick up until he re-returns. Um, yeah, no, so I think that's an interesting uh, analogy that Chase brought up. And um, so kind of continuing with that, how do you see kind of the right way to place yourself you know even just from your own perspective like you i think you gave a good example of if you don't um really know you kind of just set off on the side how do you know like figure out your place in this whole thing well mainly probably my instinct at this point is if everybody's talking about an issue i probably don't have much to contribute it's not neg neglected um like, I think this year, there's like a good chance that the most important thing that happened this year is GPT-3. And the second most important was Hong Kong. And the third most important was the CDC. And like the ninth most important is like anything related to politics or culture war from like the election down to stuff. Um, and that's because of like kind of my long-term view that I don't know, AI and geopolitics matter. and are maybe like neglected by people in the US, whereas local kind of political hot button issues are not neglected. Um, so again, trying to resist uh, the Twitter putting me into the trenches. Um, sure. I'm trying to make sure I don't get sucked into just repeating the slogans of one side or another. Um, the, there is a strong pull in general of enlisting people in the trenches by ways of, you know, meme spreading that are basically about showing allegiance. Um, usually they start with very positive slogans and no matter what the issue is that are very easy to get behind and where it kind of makes you very suspicious that you're not even willing to endorse some very benign, very like clearly good expression of like love, peace and beauty um, for some arguments about, ah, I've like seen the start from, you know, this like benign, and then once people are enlisted, and it's clear that this slogan marks you as part of, you know, the green team fighting against the purple team, now you're in the war. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, point about slogans, and how uh, a lot of very complex things can get distilled into a small, catchy phrase. And also how uh, it's hard to get things that aren't able to be distilled into a phrase to be catchy. You know, it's almost like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy that the uh, complex ideas will get um, destroyed <laughs> if, if they get popular. Yeah, like in trenches, you're like, it's a cue and there's the other side. There's not a lot of nuance. Uh, 
Yes, again, I'm, like, I'm trying to, like if everybody started talking about AI in China tomorrow, I guess with China it's starting to happen. I'm like, okay, I probably don't have much to add. Uh, what else is neglected? Oh, I don't know, like uh, artificial yeah. meat. That's interesting. People don't seem to be talking about artificial meat. This could be a big day, I think. I'll probably spend more time reading about that. And art. Chase has returned, so Hi. I'm back. Welcome back. The internet completely <laughs> died. Did you say efficient meat? Artificial meat. Oh, artificial meat, like uh, like Memphis meats. Yeah. Yes. Do you do you have anything to weigh in on on that? Because that's. Uh, I can't wait for it. As someone who uh, eats meat, it's not a lot of meat because I think it's ethically bad uh, to eat meat. Try to avoid the animals that seem to be have a lot of suffering per calorie. But even the animals that they do eat, like beef and lamb, I'm not that sure that they're not suffering too much per calorie. So kind of selfishly, I guess, for my own and, you know, for the sake of the cows and for the sake of my conscience and stomach. I can't wait for lab-grown meat. It would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Same. I, it's really funny to me the, the icky response that people have to that. Like lab grown, I don't know, but like in my mind, if it's if it's chemically undifferentiable, if that's the right word, from farm grown meat, like I'm not sure that I see the problem. But I, you know, yeah. But again, the other side will say, like when you go out and eat stuff, um, you very like think about oh, what's the chemical composition of it? You have like strong gut feelings about what you like eating and what you don't. Yeah. So again, someone who's not used to this very like, detached way of thinking of like, oh, well, you know, like chemically, it's, it's even has a higher protein content. I, again, I can understand the other side. I say, well, you know, I don't care what chemical composition. Like my gut knows what I want to eat, what I like and what not. I want to know it was like a real cow out in pasture. And I can try to convince them, but really at some point, it's not like they share my epistemology and my philosophy and they're just being wrong and evil. Right. Like our disagreement is a like way, way upstream from that about do we care about chemical composition or not? <laughs> yeah. You mentioned GPT-3. Uh, can you talk about that? What what exactly is that? Like, So I've seen, for context, you put a, a really interesting post uh, or a couple of posts on <laughs> your blog where you co-wrote with... GPT-3. Am I understanding that correctly? What yeah. what was that and what, what is GPT-3? I, I can talk about it not very intelligently uh, because for a rationalist, I am somewhat uninformed about AI, but sure. it is a predictive text modeling uh, model uh, issued by OpenAI, which is an organization working on AI founded by a lot of people, including Elon Musk. It isn't strictly part of one of the big tech giants. Um, so what it does, it's a deep learning system, like a neural network, I'm pretty sure. So it doesn't have like any super fancy tricks, except that it's very big. So it has a lot of parameters and it was trained in a lot of internet text. And basically all that it's trying to do is uh, write text that would make sense based on some prompt. So if you give it a couple of sentences, um, it kind of sees based on this model that it learned from all the online text about, okay, what sort of, you know, word would come next. And given that word, what sort of word makes sense uh, later to come? Now, given this thing where like, it says things not because, you know, it has some like model of the world and it's describing it, but it's just saying words that correlate together, putting them into sentences and then stringing sentences that seem to correlate together. Uh, it is able to write long bodies of text that at first glance seemed to be like better than most college essays. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, I gave it some prompts and then let it run, like have a dialogue. And this is a very limited version of GPT-3 through what is basically like a video game, like a text-based video game uh, where you can write prompts and have it generate text back. So I wrote a blog post where I wrote less than 50% of the text and they chose the remaining 50%. And maybe you can guess most of it who wrote what, but it still probably wouldn't guess all of it. And the rest of it is pretty good. Um, a couple of things about it that are scary. A is just, you start realizing that 
a lot of what people do is probably kind of something like this. So I actually tried GPT-3 as therapy. Uh, I wrote a couple of tweets describing a particular anxiety that I had. And then a couple of friends wrote me with some advice. And their advice didn't really strike me as useful. And then a third friend came and said, hey, just copy paste this into GPT-3, see what it says. And so I wrote in, I am talking to the world's best therapist who wants the best for me. And then I copy pasted the two tweets. And then he generated a discussion between me and the therapist, completely AI generated, that actually seemed more insightful and useful than what my friends told me. Hmm. Um, and then there is, okay, like my job and a lot of other jobs, right? Uh, web design, for example, this is something people are already use in this model for, you can describe just in text how you want a web page to look and it will generate like the HTML or JavaScript code that does that. Uh, basically, a lot of what people already do is text prediction. Um, so the first kind of scary thing about it is that it's already close to human level at a lot of things in terms of like just predicting text covers a lot of useful things. And also, and this is something that I really just trust other smarter people who wrote about this, um, it is basically doesn't seem to be hitting any ceiling of performance. So when there were like previous models similar to this, that just had like fewer parameters trained and less data, had fewer layers, and they weren't as good. And like, it wasn't clear what would happen if we just throw more parameters and have like a 500 gigabyte model instead of like a 10 megabyte one if it's gonna reach a ceiling of performance or if it's just gonna keep getting better and better. And so, so far it just keeps getting better and better. Uh, a lot of people predicted uh, a ceiling or a leveling off of performance and that's not really happening. And mm -hmm. so we don't really know how much better they will be. Like, will GPT-4 be already like just better than me at writing blog posts in general or if it will be basically the same? Um, that's got a lot of societal implications yeah <laughs> are, are you are you familiar with uh some of the political space of, of ai implications like I, i'm thinking of andrew yang and how like a whole lot of his platform was based on this idea of a whole bunch of these jobs are going to be replaced by ai in the near future if they haven't already and that's just sort of the beginning of the beginning. Uh, yeah, so it's interesting that like Andrew Yang was mostly talking about, oh, there's 3 million truck drivers. Right. Like when you have self-driving cars, they'll be out of a job. Now it turns out that uh, like plumbing is very hard for a robot. Uh, driving a truck is kind of hard for a robot. Uh, writing college essays on I don't know, Aristotelian philosophy is actually something <laughs> that turned out to be easier for a robot to do or jobs like maybe a web designer or copywriter might actually. So it's not just that more jobs are a threat of automation very soon, um, but also that's a different ones than the ones we thought. Like self-driving trucks might still be a while away, but a lot of text-based jobs are suddenly seen and performance and comfortably close to professional people from this one simple model. That makes sense also just based on a, you know, how many people a wrong self-driving truck could kill per truck, you know, and how many people a wrong text file could kill, you know? <laughs> yeah. How many people could a wrong text file kill? Put a num on it. Depen yeah, let's put a num on it. Depends on the context. Jacob, what are some of the other topics that you've been uh, thinking about in depth recently? Um, if there's anything else that you want to hit. I have read uh, two good books recently that um, seem to be very relevant to the present day, maybe because of political turmoil. Um, one is Ross Douthat's Decadent Society, and the other is Martin Gurry's uh, The Revolt of the Public and the Crisis of Authority. Um, Martin Gurry's book is kind of shocking. It was written in 2014. Uh, if you had read it today, you'd think, oh, he just like read the news from the last six months and described them as they happened, except he predicted them all six years ago. 
Um, so this, the, one of the basic theses of uh, the, revol the revolt of the public is that uh, we've had a lot of authorities, everything from like universities to governments, to like sciences, I think, to major newspapers, that so much relied on, relied on monopoly of information uh, to kind of maintain their status and their authority. Um, and then with basically a lot of information being available to everyone on the web where everyone can post a video and then we need to wait. Right, so sometimes like posting a video of George Floyd, for example, uh, it undermines the authority of both like news media or otherwise we would like publish their own edited videos but now any person can just post their own. It undermines the authority of the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, so basically a lot of authorities, I guess again, the best way to describe them, um, now their failures are being laid bare. Uh, and this mostly engenders a lot of anger and negation. Um, and it kind of points to 2011 as the start of that with the Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street and protests like the Indignados in Spain. And pointing that the general thing that seems to be happening is not that better institutions are rising to take the place of the governments, the newspapers, the scientific establishment, et cetera, that are failing, but mostly they just, people that are getting angry, they just want to destroy and negate something. And it kind of turns into a bit of nihilism. Uh, they just go and protest, but most of the protest is against someone, not in favor of some policy. And that it's unclear what's going to happen with this, except that a lot of authoritative institutions that we have right now uh, probably will not survive, and we're not sure what will come after them. And again, this applies to things like the CDC. Uh, like normally, an idiot like me who just sits at home won't be able to undermine the CDC authority, whereas now I can go on Twitter and say, hey, here's what they say, I have screenshots, Here's the actual data we have. Look, they're lying to you. Mm. Uh, they're just relying on their past authority that's not earned by their current performance. Uh, so what are the tools that we can use to navigate that? Because that's, that's not a world that, I mean, a world of collapsing authorities or failing institutions that if you are drifting, for lack of a better term, lead to the fear, the anger, the nihilism. Uh, what, what are the, we're, most people are not equipped with the tools to deal with that. What tools should we equip ourselves with and how do we navigate that kind of a world? And so my sense, so, so the quick summary, Rose Douthat's book is talking that on a societal level, we're kind of stuck in, so decadence to him basically is a shorthand for frustration, repetition, uh, and stagnation. Saying like, look, nothing's happening in politics. There's like no new ideas. Nothing's being passed by any president or Congress. Uh, we're not making, there's like no new ideas in cinema. People are having less kids. People are repeating the same culture wars from the 60s. Now that's even if there's like a general distrust of authorities, then like it's very unlikely that the government or any major institutions will be able to make big changes. Uh, it seems to me the only thing that you as a person can do is make sure you're not too dependent on any of them and probably start building small things around you. So again, like I get my information on COVID mostly not from the CDC or from major legacy media newspapers, but from like eight smart people online that I found. Um, and also the people who give like a, some of the diverse group those eight, they're like not all eight rationalists, they're like not all eight agree on everything. And like, okay, so, you know, I'm gonna replace my uh, information source about pandemics with this small group. Um, you know, if I care about other things like information or social coordination, I'm gonna like build my own. Um, set personally, right? If I want to connect with like-minded people, I'm not going to do that by like, going to a university to some graduate program. But I'm going to write about topics and then hope that people who share the interest will reach out to me. Uh, like, and I organized a book club about 
the consciousness in neurology and the creed in the book, just from readers of my blog. It's probably something that otherwise I would, uh, would happen in an academic setting. That actually parallels some Stoic advice. Seneca talks about uh, not, I forget exactly the wording, but essentially not trusting that a large library will do you well, but that a well curated library where you study a lot of authors that are worth studying and don't bother with the ones that aren't will serve you much better. So interesting. Okay. Yeah, or even, I mean, a lot of people are throwing cryptocurrency into this saying, mm -hmm. well, you know, the Federal Reserve of the United States seems to be like this big powerful institution doing some like black magic things that no one understands how much do we trust them. Maybe we should diversify your financial prospects also from relying on the fiat currency of the United States. Uh, again, it's not financial advice, yeah. uh, but this is the general mood of the sort of thing you'd be doing is like small community decentralizing. Um, I'm personally not very optimistic. Like I don't have like plans of like how to build a media ecosystem better than the one we have, even if I'm unhappy with the one we have and their incentives. Um, I don't know, it seems hard. Yeah. Well, that's not a reason <laughs> not to try. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Well, Jacob, unless there are any other topics you want to hit, we can wrap up and head to questions. Uh, no, sure. Let's have the questions. Okay, cool. I lost the beginning of the group chat when we, uh, when I got disconnected. So Alex, can you see if anybody had put an exclamation point in there? And uh, once again, for anybody who does have any questions, just keep them brief and on topic. Please be courteous. And uh, we do have a relatively small group, but typically we don't allow follow up. We'll just see how questions go. Um, yeah, Joseph Bullock had a okay. question. Joseph, you're up. Hi, yeah. Uh, thanks for joining us here this evening. Um, I was just wondering, how does the rationalist com uh, community apply ethics uh, within its uh, within its framework? Uh, specifically, I was thinking if it's you know always analytical, data is inherently biased sometimes. So the idea of a concept like justice. How does the uh, rationalist community, you know, view that or incorporate that into their framework? I think in surveys of rationalists, uh, you will see that probably like at least seventy percent of people identify as utilitarian, uh, which is, I guess, the moral framework that most appeals to quantitatively oriented nerds, um, especially on a question of you know philanthropy or where to donate money. Do you like okay? make our best guess about the numbers we have, actually calculate the impact on the world of things we do. Um, now, for example, like utilitarianism maybe doesn't apply as much to your own life if you're making decisions, um, kind of like ethical issues that come up. Um, there's some general questions. So there are a lot of confusions in philosophy that seem to be like simple confusions to dispel that people get stuck on for a long time. Uh, like whether free will exists or not kind of depends on which way you define it. And a lot of it comes down to word games. So uh, again, rationality gives some good arguments for utilitarianism and where to apply it. Uh, if you care about something like the sum of happiness and suffering, uh, how you might want to think about it, not be subject to cognitive biases like scope and sensitivity where you care as much about 2,000 birds as 200,000, you're like, no, no, 200,000 are actually a lot more. And then some advice on like not getting caught up in moral philosophy, a lot of which is pretty poor and hard to tell from the good moral philosophy. But there is like a unanimous rationalist stance on ethics. Uh, probably most people, it's a lively subject of debate. I feel like a lot of people after debating this for a long time uh, the way probably people do in, I don't know, philosophy undergrad, arrive at some mix of, I don't know, the main moral systems and their own developed taste and intuitions. It may be with some 
slightly better tools to question those intuitions instead of just assuming them as a given. Yeah, I was wondering how just how, yeah how that maps to virtue ethics and 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 you know the the comparison with that. Um, I didn't mean to follow up. Sorry. Go uh, for it. Yeah, I look at it now that uh, the highest utility thing is to be virtuous, and the virtuous thing is to follow the ontological rules, and the rule to follow is to the utilitarian math. So. <laughs> <laughs> well That's said. Well said. <laughs> yeah, that, that, very nicely said. Thank you. All right. I can't see it again if there were any other questions previously. I don't see any other exclamation points. Okay. If anybody else has any questions for Jacob, go ahead and post them. Otherwise, we can wrap up. All right, Jacob, if people want to find more about you, um, I'll put some of the same links as last time in the description. Do you want to uh, pitch anything in particular? Uh, no, at Yashkov on Twitter and put an .com. That's where it's at. Um, cool. And if anyone's around Brooklyn, uh, now's the time to go for walks in the park because the math said that it's okay. It might be worse <laughs> in October. So Nice. All right. I was happy Thanks. to meet people. Thanks for coming on again. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Nice. Thank you. I'm curious. Uh, do you do you uh, are you do you follow like Brett Weinstein at all? Uh, somewhat. He was episodes of his podcast. He was referencing something. I forget where. I think it was on his interview with Joe Rogan about the. Uh, some study that had been done about with COVID or it might've been coronaviruses in general and artificial sunlight and the implications for even natural sunlight. And he was essentially saying like the implications of this study, and obviously one study is not necessarily enough to warrant a major change in behavior, but essentially was that in direct sunlight, natural or artificial, that most coronaviruses die within a, a relative manner of seconds. I, I, I'm not sure exactly what the number was it could have been. Yeah, I even heard him talking about it. If it, the virus emerged among bats who live in dark caves, mm. then I mean, from the virus has no, no reason to evolve to, let's say, be resistant, resistant to ultraviolet light. Yeah. Um, Again, I think we have like much more direct data that all like massive super spreader cases, okay, we're like, oh, we know that a lot of people were infected and we can trace where those infections happen. They, almost all of them seem to be indoors. Yeah. Uh, it might be like I'm clear being outdoors is like a hundred times safer or like eight times safer, but seems to be like at least an order of magnitude. Uh, there's like very few you know, infections are traced to a big outdoor picnic. They're all traced to a church, a club, a flight, etc. Yeah. And in the daytime in particular. And I feel like that's what I was hearing in the beginning when lockdown started was like, hey, out in the sun, you don't really need a mask outside in the sun, in the wind. Like, they're, they're, you're not really doing much, but then you go inside. And then it was masks for everyone all the time do you think that was more a failure uh, do you think that was more understanding better or, or being less confident in our previous understanding or do you think that was just a communications effort of like because I, I think a lot of times when things when policies like that are pushed it's because nuance is hard and you can't give a public guideline that says if you're in this situation and that situation and this situation be this far apart in this certain yeah this i mean the main thing i learned about public health policy is it really assumes that everyone is really 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 stupid yeah uh, maybe they have reason to assume that um again one of the like if when i go outside walking in daytime let's say through the park and i'm really not passing within six feet of people for more than half a second um I'd usually be wearing a mask uh, to support good social norms. Um, I, like, I want to be like, I want to be the norm that I want to see in the world. Yeah. 
It's like it's good for me if everybody in my neighborhood kind of in general wears masks more indoor and out. So I'm not going to like betray this norm just by uh, the same way like um, Jews are not supposed to eat something that looks like pork, even if it's not really pork. Hmm. Because other people might think it is like, well, you know, they don't know. They didn't ask you. So, yeah, I do think being outside is pretty safe. And also that uh, a general recommendation to wear masks, especially given that like, a lot of people just don't comply with it anyway because they find masks uncomfortable. Yeah. So I think it's reasonable to give a general recommendation of, hey, within six feet of a person, wear a mask. Even though the six feet is also an arbitrary number. Yeah. Now, there's some drop of curve of like virus concentration with distance. Nothing magical happens at six feet. Yeah. Except it's like an easy number for people to guesstimate. Yeah. I mean, you could take into account height differences. One of the things that we were doing is with, at the beginning, like little kids, three-year-olds, they're not at a level where even if they sneeze with open arms, their respiratory particles are uh, like the, the spray pattern of that is not necessarily, and it could be, but it's not necessarily going up in this, like they're, they're at yeah, so I've, physically I've seen a story I think levels. a few days ago that told people they're more susceptible to COVID, which actually I had the same model as you, which is told people breathe, right. uh, your breath is pretty humid. It's like a lot of small water droplets. They would slowly drop to the ground. It was a very developed model, but apparently yeah, that, there's one story that has told people get it more. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, now we've got <laughs> the, the kids wearing masks. So it, it, you know, it, even if that model is wrong, we're taking the right precautions, I suppose. Huh. Maybe kids want to feel that they're participating with everyone. Right? They just want to do what adults do. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> uh, Dave, I see you want to jump in. You have a question? Well, I was just going to put my two bits on the, the mask discussion. Uh, oh, sure. It could seem like the complication factor came in was back in March or whatever when it became evident the need for masks was going to mushroom uh, because you know nurses would be changing every time they could see another patient and it became evident that you know bus drivers need a mask, policemen everybody needs a mask. And if the recommendation was masks are important, the way our society works, the rich people will buy up all the masks. Uh, you may have forgotten this but it was about 10 years ago when we had was it Fujiyama the nuclear reactor in Japan blew up and there was a radiation scare well there was one prescription I think it was cobalt or something like that uh, that was effective to treating radiation so the rich people bought all the prescriptions so even if you could identify that you know maybe Costa Mesa California is going to have a radiation scare there was no prescription on the shelves because the rich people bought everything. So that's why they had to say the masks are not necessary. Give them to the surgeon, leave them alone. And then a couple months later when the supply uh, came up and there was adequate supply for all the nurses and surgeons and everybody else. And it became more evident that it was a airborne disease. It wasn't touching a surface uh, that it became important for everyone to wear masks. The, the countries that started wearing masks immediately, like South Korea, I think, well, a couple of months ago, they had 300 deaths against 30,000 for us that uh, we have to mask up. Uh, I agree there's some times where it may not be quite as dangerous, but we've got to get in a masked mindset to bring this, to subdue this crazy thing. Thank you. And I, I think it was a terribly stupid policy um, to tell people that, I mean, first of all, it was clear from the beginning they were lying because they said, mess don't work, leave them to the surgeons. Um, now, again, we have enough bandanas in the country for everyone, mm -hmm. the rich and the poor alike. I mean, I ordered N95 masks from Amazon in the middle of February. And because you don't actually need N95s, I ended up giving them to my friends who are in med school and they're spending time in hospitals because hospitals have run out. But... This sort of thing, again, I think this ties much to the Martin Gurry point. So if you tell people, hey, masks don't work, and then a month later you're like, aha, we were joking, of course they work. 
we just want to make sure we have them for surgeons. Now we're telling you to wear them too. And you're not getting that credibility back. And so a lot of institutions act as if they have an inexhaustible supply of credibility, uh, where really they have very little. They have a lot of credibility in their own eyes, but you can only get away with lying so many times, especially when it was clear that instead of lying, you could have told people, hey, you know, cloth masks, anything that would stop, you know, cigarette smoke would stop this. Uh, put a bandana, put a cloth mask, put whatever. Um, so I think in the long run for US health, the fact that it became clear to a lot of people that the CDC brazenly lied about the thing that they knew they would be caught on the lie. I don't see how that is good in any like time frame that's longer than the one week in March when they need to cover their ass. Yeah. And also think about how long people hold on to very quickly proven wrong information. One article that's you know refuted or taken back can influence thousands of people and they might not ever see or care to see the uh, other side. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think about that with vaccines and autism, right? There, that, that all comes from one study done in the 90s that was disproven, retracted, and the guy who did it like lost a whole bunch of his credentials for doing it. And you still, you still can't get rid of that like, let's say meme. A vaccine comes out and this is, somebody thinks, well, we need those vaccines for the most vulnerable people, not for the rich people. So we're just going to joke for a month that, oh no, vaccines cause autism after all. Oh my god! <laughs> and then after a month be like, okay, you know, we injected all the old people. Now go ahead and buy vaccines. Again, this is sort of like information authorities think that they're still information authorities, but they're not. This is the age of the internet and social media and crazy bubbles. No one has a monopoly on information anymore. If you act like you do, people catch on very quickly. Yeah. But I don't know, maybe people will notice. Maybe people haven't really been following it. And five years from now, if you ask them about how the CDC did it, like, I don't know, it probably did fine, I guess. I think most people don't track the credibility of institutions, don't really care. That's true. That's true. I, I've heard both ways on the uh, Obama administration CDC response to SARS. Or was it SARS or was it, uh, it was an influenza Ebola. outbreak? Ebola? Well, See, Ebola happened in like I don't even remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, I but I've heard both yeah. ways that like, oh, it was a good response. Here's why. And it was a bad response. Here's why. Yeah, I, I'm not keeping track of the credibility of that. That That's not something that crossed my mind. To yeah, do. if the CDC gets coded as being part of the Trump government, then Democrats would think it was bad. Republicans would think it was good. If it's being coded as, you know, the smart experts who stood up to Trump, it will be flipped. Yeah. And then like a few rationalists would stand up and say, Hey, remember, like, actually, they lied regardless of their politics. We should maybe remember that. And I mean, some people will. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We'll keep track. Okay, cool. Well, we can wrap up unless. Oh, I see. Uh, Mike has his hand raised. Mike. Okay. Uh, they, uh, what do you do? Um, a lot of the things we've been talking about go deeper into. What happens when the experts disagree? Um, and one of the things you said, uh, we could say there's enough discussion and back away from it, but those are where the problems really lie. And what do you do when the experts disagree, how you sort it all out? you have some comments on that? Yeah, it's probably been easier for like, some specific case, but again, you can do a lot of meta thinking, right? So. Even if it's on a topic I know literally nothing about, so I know some experts are discussing uh, which methodology was used to build the Inca pyramids. You see, okay, do any of them have like, any unusual incentives uh, to prove something one way or another? Uh, and there's like, some personal credibility. Maybe there's some like, people who build their career in one theory and now they'll be embarrassed that the theory is overturned. Or maybe one theory would have implications that they want to do. So again, this is not very, the sort of meta considerations don't 
like they don't hug the truth very closely. Right? Like somebody can have bad incentives and still be correct. Um, it doesn't prove anything. But that's something that you can do without any knowledge. Um, ideally, you'd want to actually look at their arguments. Um, so again, like there's like a lot of expert disagreement about hydroxychloroquine. Uh, right now, does it do? Is it good as a, like a prophylactic antiviral or not? Maybe like once you're already sick, so it's not the question of replication anymore, but you know, pneumonia and your immune response, is it good, is it not? Um, so the studies, uh, ultimately, a lot of them have like a chart saying, okay, we had those people, this was their condition. This is what happened to the ones that got hydroxychloroquine. This is what happened to the ones that didn't. It's not actually beyond most like moderately educated people to try to look into that. At least if you read like a summary of something in some news outlet and then look at the study itself and just like stare at the one big chart, at least you can tell if the newspaper article is lying to you or not. Um, without having to understand anything at all about like what hydroxychloroquine is, what happens when it interacts with zinc and the cell membranes, um, like some basic numbers of, you know, people recovered, people died. Mm. And who were those people, how they were selected to receive the drug or not. Um, seems like you can jump into that with like abstracting away a lot of the more specific knowledge. Uh, often uh, you have to make a decision with imperfect information and not enough of it. Uh, the, uh, in the vaccine trials, uh, there are about 11 companies that have built uh, vaccines that are in one sort of trials uh, now. And um, uh, the secondary indicators are what the stock market is doing to the um, price of those stocks. And some of it is... Uh, uh, some of that's real and some of that is noise. Another information, another point of information is that uh, Russia has a vaccine now and uh, they're, they're now uh, without really uh, long-term trials, they're going to vaccinate uh, 30 million people starting in November or, or starting right now even. And some of the leadership has already taken the vaccine. Would you take a vaccine uh, right now if, of the best one that's there? Uh, uh, if uh, the people on, uh, on this panel, if, uh, if, uh, if it were available? I would put an arm on it. Mm -hmm. So I would say all the decisions you make are under situations of uncertainty. Um, I mean, at this point, I have like a good estimate of my chance of catching COVID, let's say over the next year. Um, and I tried to find some reference class of, you know, other vaccine candidates, how dangerous they were, what the side effects are, um, and kind of make this trade off. Like, for me personally, uh, I think living in New York and being pretty okay, like I'm not, I don't have a need to like, take public transportation a lot. Also, I'm in my early thirties and healthy. Um, I'll probably be fine waiting. Uh, because like, the other side of the trade-off is not that big. Like the trade-off of waiting until, you know, an eight-figure number of people take the vaccine and live with it for six months to see what happens, if it actually works. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, ultimately, you, kinda, you do a trade-off. Um, yeah. Again, something with whether I should take a vaccine is probably something where I will do the math myself. And actually, I'm trying to quantify for myself. I don't know the... If the vaccine has some negative side effect, it has a 10% chance of happening. And I also know like, the negative side effects of COVID and the probability that one of them will happen to me, like long-term illness or neurological damage or lung damage, etc. cetera. Um, I would like, try to like, actually make as an equation with numbers on both sides. Uh, this is something where I don't expect that the authorities will have my personal best instinct interests in mind and they shouldn't right there's maybe like other people who need vaccines more or other interests about which vaccines to give or take Sean. Okay. thank you what do you feel is the root cause of why people can't make sense well of what's happening with covid or other types of 
large issues that keep on coming up and we end up entrenching ourselves on one side or the other instead of actually making sense well of, of what's happening. I think for most people, you can really get by a lot just by being socially savvy and not really interacting directly with physical reality or even with markets. Um, right, if you're, I don't know, if you're a farmer, uh, you have to deal with like actual physical reality. Maybe like you're a hedge fund trader, you deal with like the market that also doesn't care about who's nice and who's evil. Um, but for most people, both like in their jobs, in their social lives, in their family, everything that impacts them, like how many friends they have, what's their status, how well they do. Um, just like being well liked and being savvy to the norms of your group and kind of knowing which side to take in any arguments where you're on the side of like the winners and the most popular people. Uh, that works for most people most of the time. And we like evolve to do this very well. Mm-hmm. Um, Whereas stuff like understanding the virus, uh, it's not something we evolved to do. Like understanding how to protect from a virus when living in big cities with international travel and things like vaccines. Uh, we don't have any instincts around it. It's not like throwing you know, a basketball into the hoop where we have good evolved instincts and throwing things. And it's not a common problem that we solve, right? It's not something that comes out. Um, so there's kind of like no reason to expect people to be good at this. Um, why would they? Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Good question, Sean. All right. I think it's time to go ahead and wrap up once again. Thanks, Jacob. Appreciate you coming on and talking with us. And, um, I actually have another idea that I'd like to pitch to you, but I will, uh, text you about it. Expect a text or an email from me. All soon. Right. Cool. Thanks, everyone, for the questions. Thank you, Jacob, Chase, Alex. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Have a good night.